um, <laughs> that um, I, I started to come up with ideas. I sort of thought, well, maybe what if I just listen to the news on the radio? I'm, I'm not allowed to read it on my phone. I'm, not al- I'm certainly not allowed to read it on my phone. I'm allowed to look at it on the laptop, which I'm on my phone a lot more than my laptop. So I was coming up with rules which lasted for a while and invariably break because it's a bit like as soon as you use it once, it's a cascade, it's like smoking. It, does, it, it feels like it's not something you can, the way they've got, the way, this, the way it works for me, you can't just, did, I can't do that. I can't say I'm gonna use it once. It's, you're using it then. No, it'd be, it's like, it'd be like gambling. I mean, in a way, you know, in, a, in, a, in theory, um, gamblers could put bookies out of business. What yeah. they do is they basically just gamble till they're ahead and they never gamble again. And then by definition, you know, unless you're the unluckiest person in the world, you know, yeah. and you, you, keep, you just keep losing time after time after time. But you can, if your stopping rule is to stop when you're ahead to a certain degree, yeah, and that's it, you never do it again, ever in your life. Yeah, yeah. There's no, there's no business for bookies. They're going to they're gonna lose money. Um, yeah. But you can't. That's not how it works. Yeah. That's not how it works. The brain just uh, doesn't. So what would you say? What would you say? Okay, I've got this problem. And along with a lot of people, I read the news or look at social media and in almost always feel a bit worse afterwards. Check it on my phone. What, you know, using the knowledge that we have that this is maybe a para addiction created partially created by clever people trying to manipulate me to make sure I stay on it. You know, what do I do? Yeah. Um, first of all, you have to decide how much you care about it. You know, is this something, how much is this bothering you? Um, because what you're doing is you're making a choice between uh, which you, which you are uh, it, where the aim is to make your life better. Um, and if you're not clear that it would make your life better, well, then carry on. You know, it's fine. Um, but if, if you're pretty confident that um, changing this behavior pattern would make your life better, um, you've got to think, OK, what? And because it's a power addiction, not addiction, and therefore you have, a more, you have more control in a way over what's going on. Um, you're, you're not at the mercy of this behavior by any means. Um, you can say, okay, what you start with a very clear goal. What pattern of behavior would suit my purposes best? Would it be taking a week off or a day off or a morning off or whatever it might be? Would it be um, only you know, checking websites or social media or whatever it is within a certain time window in a given day. Um, so, and you may not be right, you know, when you, when you first set that pattern of behavior that you think is the one that you wanna go for, um, it may not be the one that gives you the most satisfaction. You may find that uh, actually, you know what, I do prefer to look at it a bit more, or I actually need to look at it less, or actually, in some cases, I need to not look at it at all, you know. So you have to be your own psychologist here and pay attention to where, to what is working for you. Um, but I suppose the first step here is to set what you think, in your best judgment, is going to be the pattern of behavior that's going to work best for you. And that can be, in, as I say, in terms of how long you spend on it, what gaps you have between doing it, and so on, or even how you do it, the, the manner in which you engage with it. Um, uh, but it, but it, it's so you've got a very clear behavioral goal. It's interesting that you say this actually, because um, in, in a similar, I can't spell, um, when I was putting up, when I first was putting up earlier this year, putting up YouTube videos, right? And YouTube is clever. Obviously, they're all clever at getting you to stay on their platform and to incentivize you in ways that you didn't even think would be an incentive for you, such as 
how is this video performing with your previous video? And you would, might not even think about yeah. that. Might not even occur to you. You might well, not even. How how is it performing? Yeah. <laughs> Once they do it, oh my god, how is it performing compared? Yeah. To what they say? You know, it's a bit like it's been a test. You've had a test, and now how are you constantly doing on this constant test? And I realized after about a week of doing this on the YouTube um, stuff, and bearing in mind. You know, I'm getting about 20 views on my, my <laughs> things, right? Um, and um, but even so, the the brain was doing the same thing as though I was getting a million views. I'd seen people who were very successful on YouTube talking about pretty much exactly the same experience of dissatisfaction. They were getting, if they weren't getting a million views, they were feeling bad about themselves, like tearful about themselves. You know, and you're going, what? You know, <laughs> that seemed crazy. Um, and then I set a boundary, which was that quite simply, I was simply not going to log in to YouTube. Um, I was, I was only going to do it once a week when I uploaded my new video, I log in, do it and then log out and putting that very tight time on it alleviated. It meant that I didn't have to keep worrying about it the whole time, you know, that the checking, mm. you think mm. the checking of your statistics will alleviate an anxiety but it's almost slightly ocd actually it mm. alleviates mm. it for a moment mm. and then and then you need to do it again you need to do it again i never thought about that connection until i said actually but they're almost encouraging slightly in fact they are encouraging with these refreshes ocd of, behaviors they're encouraging ocd behaviors aren't they now i see it. it's really obvious yeah um and actually, they they momentarily alleviate anxiety, but long term make it worse and worse. Mm. Um, mm. Long term make it worse and worse. So in That's fact, it. they're encouraging again. And it's not you couldn't you wouldn't say, oh, I've got OCD. It's a behavior. No, para OCD. <laughs> so, um, you know, what? I do have a question that was just I realized as we were talking as an earlier for earlier in the book, but I realized that I don't think we have a definition of I don't know exactly where we would put it, maybe training the animal brain, we use we use the word conditioning, what is mm. conditioning? Mm. Conditioning? Yeah, well, I think it's something that every human being should understand the definition of and how it works. Um, uh, and I guess a lot of people do because we know about Pavlov's dogs and what's known as classical conditioning. Um, yeah. And we know about carrots and sticks, which is effectively operant conditioning. So conditioning is, um, is a learning process in which the brain forms an association between uh, two or more things. Obviously, in the case of uh, Pavlov's dogs, it's between the sound of a bell and the, and the experience of eating food. And so... Yeah. What's, is, this what, the, is this the same as associative learning then? It's ex, it is. Ex, it, a conditioning is associative learning. Ah, OK. In that case, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. Well, put it this way. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, uh, I don't want to sort of um, uh, I don't want to get on the wrong side of my uh, colleagues in learning theory who would say that there are differences, but to all intents and purposes conditioning is associative learning. If one wanted to be picky about it, it's a form of associative learning. It's a form of, but... Because but this is, this you wouldn't, is, so, so for example, um, uh, conditioning isn't a term that you would apply to uh, learning to memorize things by associations. So there's, you know, th there are other ways in which we form associations between ideas, uh, but conditioning is typically between um, is between a uh, a stimulus and some some kind of internal or external response to that stimulus. Right um, now, is that just? Do we need to make, you know, the distinction you just made between you wouldn't apply conditioning to what was that to memorize? Well, so, so, you know, let's say, uh, mem you know, when you, when you people do these memory tricks where you, you learn to um, like to put, uh, if you're trying to learn numbers or something like that, or words or names, you put them in places in an imaginary room. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, oh yeah, all of those mnemonic techniques, they they work through a process of associative learning, but you wouldn't call that they, people wouldn't call that conditioning. Because you're conditioning yourself. Um no, well, because the associations are between one idea and another idea. Um, right. uh, but the, it's the basic, you know, it is the base. Associative learning is the foundation of all learning in the human brain. Uh, and it's wired into our synapses and, and the way that nerves are connected to each other. Um, and of course, forms the, has formed the basis for um, machine learning. Uh, a lot of machine learning algorithms are modeled on neuronal associative learning. Um, so, so conditioning, I think, would be, you know, the way to think about it is it's, it's a form of associative learning in which what you're learning is an association between a stimulus of some sort, uh, typically coming from outside the body that you're perceiving or experiencing, um, and some form of response, whether it's um, salivation uh, or whether it's, you know, the muscle movements necessary to press a lever or to drink a, a can of Coke. Right. Uh... So put it, let me put it another way <laughs> as I'm thinking about it. I, I, I suppose you could consider conditioning a form of stimulus response le associative learning. It's just that the response doesn't have to be um, uh, you know, behavioral. It could be, it could be, you know, as I say, glandular. Uh, it could be emotional. You can have, you can condition emotional responses like, um, you know, conditioned anxiety is classically an example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, emotional glandular behavior. Okay. Mm, and it, and it's, and it takes place through repetition. And, you know, I mean, there's, what, what, why? One of the reasons I think that every human being on the planet should or would benefit from learning about it is there's been so much really good work done on how it all works and that, that's, that is far from obvious, um, but is very important in the way that people who do understand about these things shape our behaviour. Such as... Uh, Oh, well, such as in gambling or Facebook or, you know, all of the things we were just talking about, you know, they are basically conditioning us. That's exactly what the process is. And they know how to do it. So do we, and I think we need to build defences against that because that is, that really is manipulating, isn't it? I mean, yeah. that's, not, that's not getting us to do something because we think it's a good idea. That's getting us to do something because our brain uh, has been conditioned to do it. I mean, it's brainwashing, really, in a way. I mean, this is one thing that's come up, probably can't put this in, but I've, no, I probably could actually, but it's come up a lot with documentaries. There's, there's a lot of documentaries now, which have an, ad all documentaries tend to have an agenda of some kind, but they have an agenda such that they're just trying to put almost a single point of view across using as many techniques as, you know, but polemical, basically. Oh, yeah. They, they, I mean, uh, having taken part in a few documentaries in my time, yeah. uh, you know, it's very clear when you're first contacted by a researcher or a producer what they want to get across. And you know that they will ask questions in such a way they sometimes would even prompt responses uh, and they will edit and they will use music and they will use imagery. Uh, and it, uh, you know, documentaries are without question a polemic device to persuade you of a point of view. Yeah, I think... Um, well, I have to say, n uh, actually... Not necessarily. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, uh, I... Well... Now let's 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 take the extreme view, which is necessarily, because I, I, I was going to think I was going to say well actually a, you know a, 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 a an exception to this would be things like you know music documentaries you know about the Beatles or the Eagles or the Stones or something like that. But actually, you know what? You know, if they if they were just sort of um, without an agenda, 
yeah. trying to, just giving you information about the Beatles, they would be boring as hell. They yeah, would not. They would work. An agenda is not the same as being polemic, is it? Having, a, having no. an agenda of some, having a point of view is not the same as being polemic. Polemic indicates a certain slipshod nature with facts, you know, a okay. transcendental nature to facts okay. in order to get a point across. So, and, 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 a, and a very much a straw manning the other side. Ten, it yeah, tends to yeah, be that would be a classic side. device. Um, because this be could be for our persuade book, convince, yeah, yeah. I should say. Um, that's interesting. And maybe we could bring that into convince. Yeah. Um, so um, it's it's a continuum, probably, isn't it? Because it's a um, uh, and also running alongside that continuum is is what the motive is. So you know, yeah. you do a documentary about uh, you know the Beatles or something like that, and and your motive isn't to persuade people to like the Beatles, you know, and, and to hate the Rolling Stones. You know, your 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 agenda is that you have you've got a narrative which you uh, which you have wanted to get across because because you found that fascinating and uh, you think it's cool, you know, in some way. Yeah. Um, and so your job is to is to try and get that narrative across, but but you're not, but not because not for some extrinsic motivation, not because you want to, you know, you you um, you need people to vote for the Beatles or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but because you thought it was a really good idea. Whereas I think you're right when it comes to uh, polemic documentaries, which I, I still think is probably a majority of them. Um, they're on issues. They're on issues, and you yeah. and you have a viewpoint, you know whether it's on e-cigarettes are good or e-cigarettes are bad, or um, uh, you know eating uh, fish is good or meat or whatever or bad or whatever. So, um, and when you have that, I suppose the difference is that when you have that, you will say things that aren't true. Or you will create impressions that aren't accurate from yes. what you say. You know, with a lot of behaviours that are addictive, like um, you know, drinking alcohol. Um, for every addict, you know, every person who clearly would meet all the criteria for being addicted to alcohol, yeah, there's a substantial number, two or three times that number, who are drinking too much alcohol. Um, you wouldn't say they're addicted. I would say they have this para addiction. You know, they like it, they enjoy it. They're uh, th they're having to weigh up the potential health risks and the and the enjoyment or other functions that it serves. And in some cases, you know, it spills over into and becomes a, an addiction. Um, in other cases, but in most cases, there is something they can do about it. And so going back to your point about um, what practical support and help can people get from a book like this, um, it would be to engage with uh, those behavior change tools which have been designed specifically for that. Um, for example, the Drink Less app, which was developed at UCL, as you know, um, it's specifically designed with, for people who are drinking too much but are not actually addicted. And you can apply tools for that in you know about about setting if then rules uh, about um, about behavioural substitution, all these uh, techniques that you can use for behaviours that you're struggling to control to the extent that you want to. So, you know, I know there was behavioural substitution if then rules. Did you have um, any others to add? Distraction. Um, um, uh, Actually, um, uh, identity, you know, shaping your identities so that, you know, with identity, you say, right, this is the kind of person I am. I don't do this to this degree. Um, uh, things like uh, reshaping your normative beliefs around things, you know, for example, with alcohol. It's a, it is one of these very interesting phenomena that um, people who uh, drink heavily greatly overestimate the extent to which everyone else drinks heavily. 
So they think they're not, they think this is perfectly normal. Um, and I'll, and, and uh, so if you can help people to re, recalibrate what are known as descriptive norms, that, that is the extent to which they believe everyone else is doing something. Because imagine, you know, let's say, you know, I drink, uh, you know, 21 units a week, let's say, of alcohol. And I'm thinking, yeah, everyone, everyone drinks, you know, 21 units a week. Imagine in a world where someone said to you, you drink what? You drink 21 units a week. No one drinks 21. You know, you need to go get help um, because the norm actually is quite a bit less than that. Um, then, you know, that can be a factor as well.